So before I get going, just a disclaimer, my body is feeling very confused this morning. Uh, yesterday I spent the entire day moving house, went to bed exhausted, woke up to a coffee, came here, had a drink queenie, because Ross, and then Rochelle brought me another coffee, so I'm not quite sure where I am. My body isn't sure whether I'm excited or, or tranquil, um, but we'll figure that out. So before we get going, Ross, thank you for that introduction. Uh, before we get going, I wanted to introduce myself as well. And the reason being that when the initial invite went out for this talk, uh, a word was omitted. And having a word omitted really changed the context of what I'm going to be speaking about today. So the initial title was Curiosity, Cat Killer, Fear Conqueror, Fire Starter. But the initial invite said, Eric Kruger, Cat Killer. <laughs> Fire starter. <laughs> and one person was interested in coming, so I'm not sure <laughs> what you were expecting when you, when you came here. <laughs> so, as Ross said, I'm a, I'm a personal development and leadership coach, uh, founder of Better Man, South Africa's biggest community for men. I have a, a private coaching mastermind called the Apex Club, and busy this year completing my master's in business and executive coaching. So the initial title, Curiosity, Cat Killer, Fear Conqueror, Fire Starter, I gave that to Ross to, to leave me, myself a bit of space so that I could play with the idea. But the talk that I'll be giving today is called How to Be an Alchemist, The Art of Turning Curiosity into Action. And the idea behind it, well, first of all, it's a, it's a bit of a hat tip to Paolo Kulo, one of my favorite authors. He wrote The Alchemist. Any of you read The Alchemist? Yeah. yeah, good. If you haven't read it, re go and read it. Uh, it's a book that I reread every year. And secondly, I thought it's a fitting analogy for what I'll be speaking about today. For those of you who don't know, an alchemist is someone who has several disciplines they pursue throughout their lives. But the one is taking uh, raw material, raw metal, and turning it into noble metal. So taking lead, and turning it into gold. If you're curious about what that process is called, it's called chrysopia, turning raw metal into noble metal. So when Ross initially told me that I had to speak about curiosity, I can't say that I was very excited. It's because I've never really thought about curiosity. For most of us, it's just something that's inherent to us. We are naturally curious about the world, but we never really think about what is curiosity? And so I went on this journey with curiosity. And for the first part of the talk, I'm, I just want to share my journey with you. And then for the second part, we'll talk about a bit more of a practical application, how it's played out in my life. And it's very interesting to me, some of the insights that I sort of stumbled across has definitely changed the way that I'm looking at the creative process and how curiosity feeds into that. So the very first thing that I thought, I need to be close enough to this thing. There we go. The very first sort of insight was that curiosity on its own isn't that interesting. If you are simply curious, then all you'll end up being is the smartest person at your local quiz night. That's all that curiosity brings you. For curiosity to become something more, something meaningful, it has to converge with something else. So when curiosity converges with a problem, a business is born. When Joe Gebbia and Brian Chesky wondered whether people would pay to go into someone else's house and rent a room from them, Airbnb was born. When curiosity converges with another person, you get a deep, meaningful relationship. That's the only way we can go through the world to really build relationships, is to be curious about someone else. When curiosity converges with science, we get drones, we get cars that are launched into space, and we get closer every day to finding the cure for cancer. But it's because of the convergence. So curiosity on its own isn't that interesting. The second thing, that, a bit further down this road, 
was that I realized as soon as we talk about curiosity, what we talk about is the external world. You have to be curious about the things that are outside of you, the news, uh, knowledge about a specific topic. But what about being curious about yourself? And this is the coaching we're speaking, right? So what makes you bold? What makes you powerful? What makes you unique? Which limiting beliefs have you ingrained over the years that are keeping you from achieving what you want to achieve in your life? Which habits have you formed that are keeping you stuck? And so the, the language of curiosity is questions. And we ask a lot of questions about everything that happens out there, but we don't ask many questions about what's happening in here. And so really, I hope that you understand that the, the journey of curiosity should really start here and then radiate outwards from there. I have an obsession with, with podcasts. So I listen to tons of podcasts. I listen to them at one and a half times speed so I can get through more. But I have a, a practice that keeps me sane. When I listen to a podcast and I, I come across a very profound insight, I stop the podcast, and for the rest of the drive, I just finish it in silence. And this allows me to really think about this insight that I just learned. How can I apply it to my life? What does it really mean? How can I make it a, a bigger part of my being? And in the build-up to this talk, I was driving home the one day, and I was listening to a podcast, trying to focus on the road, uh, trying to think about curiosity. And I kept getting stuck. It felt like I just couldn't get past my initial thought about curiosity. And then I decided to switch off the podcast and just finish the drive in silence. I needed to eliminate one of the inputs. And as soon as that happened, a lot of the insights that formed the basis for this talk started pouring out of my mind. And it was because of this creation of space. And I realized that a, a great companion for curiosity is space. And that it's important for us to create that space intentionally in our day. I got home and I, I wrote one of my emails and I, I wrote that podcasts stimulate thinking, but the silence expands it. And you can fill in the, fill in the blank here. Curiosity stimulates thinking, silence expands it. Reading books stimulates thinking, but the silence expands it. And so it's important for us to intentionally create the silence. <coughs> A great benefit from, from the silence is that you allow your thoughts to deepen. So you allow your ideas and your creativity and your curiosity to bloom. And you can go beyond the obvious. Like I said, initially I felt really stuck. It seems to me like the question I should be answering here today is how do we cultivate curiosity? I'm very analytical, so it made sense to me. If curiosity feeds creativity, then the more curious I can be, the more creative I can be. And so that was my first thought. How do we cultivate curiosity? So I wanted to go to the dictionary, get the definition. I wanted to see the origin of the word. I wanted to go to Google Scholar and see what are the psychologists saying about curiosity? How do we get more curious? But then when I started really thinking about it, giving it space, I realized that I'm quite curious as it is. I don't need to be more curious. And I started speaking to people around me and they were saying that I'm quite curious and I don't need to be uh, curious about what you are interested in, I can be curious about what I'm interested in. And I realized they don't need to be more curious, they are curious enough. And so it became obvious to me that, at least for the people that I've spoken to, including myself, it wasn't a question of how do we cultivate curiosity, but rather how do we channel curiosity? How do we take curiosity and turn it into something meaningful, into something actionable, into something that ultimately gives us results. But of course, as with almost everything in life, curiosity has a shadow side. And this shadow side 
manifests itself in unread books, in unlistened podcasts in your playlist, in the hundreds of books that you download on Kindle but never take the time to read. I'm very guilty of this that I would buy a book and I start reading it and then I see this next awesome book and I want to buy that so I'd rather buy that when I start reading this one and it, you end up with this whole library full of books that you've never read. And I think it's, it's motivated by this, this search for that magic bullet, that one thing that's going to inspire you, that one thing that's going to show you how to, to do it and how to make it easier, that one thing that's going to show you how to be successful. And that's why we keep looking and keep looking. Yet we know that this isn't the way that things get done. So it's easy to hide behind curiosity because as long as I'm learning, I'm doing something, but really, are you doing anything? So the process of alchemy consists of these three actions then. You're looking for that convergence. You're trying to see how can you channel your curiosity into something more productive. And you are creating space. So for the next little bit, I want to show you how this has played out in my life. And I'm hoping that you can take some practical insights from it. We'll start with convergence. So, as Ross was saying, I write a daily email, and I've done so for the past two years. Uh, at the moment, going out to about 18,000 people, uh, I've sent, this morning was email number 588. And in total, all the emails that I've sent over the years, it's just more than 8 million, uh, 67 or 68,000 words accumulated. And if you wanted to sign up, that's where you can go. So... Let me just tell you the story of how I got to this. In 2009, I got bit by this bug that I wanted to be an online entrepreneur. Before that, I was a physiotherapist. But, uh, so in 2009, I decided online entrepreneur. And uh, I had this brilliant idea to start a website called, I think my first one was called Gym Spots, it's up there somewhere. And uh, to call it brilliant ideas, maybe a bit of an exaggeration, it was an idea. And I, I reached the domain, I got the website up and running, got the Facebook page, the Twitter account. And then a couple of days later, I had a brilliant new idea. And I registered the domain and I built the website and I got the Facebook page up and running, got the Twitter account. And I started telling people about it. And about a week later, I had a brilliant new idea and I got the domain, I got the website, I got the Facebook page. And this went on for four years and about 45 of these domains. But while I was in the process, I was really interested in digital marketing. So I immersed myself in the world and I became better at Facebook campaigns and Google AdWords and copywriting. And in 2014, I finally said, let me focus and just do one thing. And that one thing was a website called Better Man. And Better Man just felt like a very natural outlet for me. I've always been interested in self-development. And the idea behind the site was pretty simple. It's about being a better man when you go to bed at night compared to when you woke up that morning. So using the skills that I'd acquired over the years, it was pretty easy to scale this. But the question became, how do I get my message across to my audience? What is the best way to communicate with them? So that convergence was happening. And I tried different forms of content. I tried video, I tried audio, I tried long form posts. And eventually I thought, what if we could just do a short daily post? Something short, powerful, motivational, inspirational, and practical. And once I tried that, it really became the foundation of everything in Better Man. It took off, people loved it. Uh, initially I thought I, I would love to have an email newsletter that actually had word-of-mouth marketing behind it. And now that's what I've created. But it all started with that convergence. It all started with trying out different things. So in order to write a daily email, you need to create content every day, which is a hard thing to do. And the way that I create space in my life to allow for this is I intentionally have time in the morning to meditate. 
I intentionally have time in the morning to journal. But I think the most important thing is that I create these micro moments during the day, like turning off the podcast or writing in my, in my notebook whenever I have a new idea. And I can take that, that space. I can take what I've learned and what I've expanded in that space and I can take it into the channeling process, into the creative process. And that's by far the number one question that I get asked all the time is, how do you sit down and write this daily email? And I always tell people about this quote from Stephen King. Amateurs sit and wait while the rest of us just get up and go to work. And I think this is crucial to understand that the first part of this channeling process is about the mindset. It's about adapting professional posture. It's about saying that I'm, I'm not going to play the amateur game anymore. It's that I'm going to become serious about this thing that I want to create. The second part of that is maybe a bit more practical. And it's a process called accretion. And this is something that I've spoken about a lot. I have an entire talk just on this. But accretion ultimately is the accumulation of all the things that we do. All the decisions that we make. All the actions that we take. And if you look at your life today, you are an exact accumulation of all your decisions and all of your actions. But what I love about, about accretion is that it gives you permission to start small. Because we're playing the long game. And if we're playing the long game, then we can be patient. And we can allow for that accumulation to happen. If you're playing the short game and you write a 100-word email today, most of my emails average between 100 and 150 words. A 100-word email today means nothing. Tomorrow, it's 200 words. Still not really impactful. But two years down the line, it's 68,000 words. And so that accumulation is important. And what accretion says is that you can take curiosity and you can take it out of the ether and make it more real bit by bit. You don't have to wait for perfect. You don't have to wait for big. You can just start. But for the curious, it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to create. And I understand why. It's because we, we take our alchemy and we show it to the world and they can disapprove of it. Even worse, they can ridicule it. They can break it down. And if you've poured your heart and your soul and your being into this thing, then it's hard to see people break it down and tear it down. But if there's one thing that every alchemist needs to know, it's captured in these three words. Creativity takes courage. To create takes courage. It has to. If it wasn't for the fact that it took courage, then the act would lose its value. This is how we go through that alchemy process, with courage. So I'm hoping that today you, you've been inspired at least to a certain extent to take the raw metals and the raw material of curiosity and to mold it and to twist it and to shape it and to ultimately turn it into something precious, something valuable, something meaningful. And that you'll go out of here not only staying curious, but doing curious. Thank you very much. No, no. What, what tools and tricks do you have that help you create something every single day? So there's always the... <laughs> it's funny, because when, when people ask you about the daily email, uh, so the, the question was, uh, which uh, tools and tricks do I use to create the daily email? And I always find it interesting because we always want to know, like, which word process do you use? So it's not about the, the mindset that comes to it, it's about, like, which exact tools do you use? So I can use that because then I can replicate what you are doing. Um, but I'm using, I use Evernote. So uh, the, the entire process is I 
during the day, you know, when you have the idea that I have to create content, you look at the world very differently. So you're always looking for inspiration and motivation. And if you see it, you capture it, because otherwise you lose it. So the way I capture it is I use Evernote. Uh, I have a little like uh, folder just called Daily Email Inspiration. And I'll, I'll just have a, a bunch of ideas in there. And I never batch emails because I want it to be relevant to how I'm feeling that day. But if I do get to the day and I'm bashing my head against the wall, feeling uh, like there's just no inspiration anywhere in the world, then I go to my ideas folder. So and that's a very important part of what I do. Uh, when I'm in the car and we're just talking about this, I also use my little voice note uh, recorder. And then from a, if you want to know, I use Active Campaign uh, to send the emails. But really, to be honest, I think the biggest part of it is just your approach to the world, right? So like I said, if you know that there's a daily email that needs to go out, you're always looking for something that inspires you to write it. And an extremely big part of what has kept me going over the past two years has been the fact that I'm accountable. If in the morning, and it's happened a few times, uh, I, I typically write the email the day before and schedule it for about 5.45 the next morning. If somehow my email subscriber screwed up and the email's delayed for about an hour, I start getting emails, are you okay? Did something happen? Like, I haven't gotten my email yet. So there, there are always people on the other end and I feel, I feel a sense of obligation that I, I need to deliver. They've signed up to the service, they expect something, even though it's free, they expect something from me. And I want to make sure that I, I provide on it every day. Does it help? Yeah. So it's, yeah? Hi, um, everybody hear me? I'm the mic. Um, I can ask questions, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, just as this point into um, more of a psychology of curiosity, um, and I'm sure your coaching training um, and lots of conversations and, and a reflection have um, maybe given insight to this. Um, this aspect around curiosity and boundaries and the f f factor of permission, I find an interesting aspect of the self showing up to be curious. Um, it's something I had a conversation with uh, with somebody recently and I, I, I see it and I notice it in South Africa this inner subconscious radar of may I, can I, am I allowed to because of frames of reference we've been conditioned to refer to to be us, to be ourselves, particularly in our society and I'm making some assumptions, um, some suppositions, but it's something I'd like you to unpack because I think it has relevance to how innovative we can be as individuals, as collectives, as a society in South Africa to solve our own problems and those of a broader society. I'd be interested to hear your views on that. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure how to unpack that view, to be honest. Um, what, I, what I do think is that we have to always know which role we are playing. And like you're saying, you know, there, there's a space for, for you as a person and there's a space for you being part of a community or a collective. Um, but to be honest, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to unpack that for you. Uh, I do think that curiosity needs to start with ourselves and that we need to be okay to look inside first. But we can't change other people's perceptions. Like for me, that's, um, with coaching especially, you need to get someone to to that point by themselves. Like me telling you something doesn't change the way you see it. Um, I can be curious and over time that curiosity leads me to certain changes. But it's an internal process. And that's about the best I can give you about for that for now. Also asking whether it's an external process as well, because the environment in which we find ourselves does perhaps impact us in terms of the boundaries that we manage around how much we I share, how much we express, how much we manifest our curiosity in our creativity. And interesting, there was a talk, and I think the speaker is here through Creative Morning. Um, 
at, at a, a work co-working space just down the road. And um, it was interesting to hear how the expression of creativity can manifest. Um, and you can break boundaries of norm, what you perceive as norm. So uh, it's something I'm intrigued around because I think there's a lot of stereotyping that we ascribe to that might inhibit ornament ourselves in being more curious and creative. Mm. That's a good point, and it's something I'd like to think on definitely. Thank you. I just want to say thank you very much, Eric. And two short questions. So the first one is for a better man. Did you find there was like a tipping point at some stage with your audience growth and your community? And what was that? And then just a second question is that I'm curious about what podcasts you listen to. Uh, <laughs> there are so many. Uh, so with Better Man, uh, the, probably my biggest insight that I've learned from um, trying to cultivate an online community is that you have to be willing just to put your money where your mouth is. So uh, I've been a big fan of uh, running ads to get people into my community. And even though there's always like a sort of a slow uh, drip of, of guys coming into the community, it always accelerates when I'm running ads. And for me, it's always been money well spent because through that, you end up building credibility and authority and uh, you build your business. But I can't say that there's been a tipping point where all of a sudden people just came flooding in. Uh, what's been interesting is that the bigger the community became, the more the community was saying, this is what we want to do. So out of the community came events. Um, and really the community pushed me to become a coach and the community pushed me to become a speaker. I never really envisioned that I would be any of those things. Uh, but as I got bigger, um, the community like takes on a, a life of its own. And that probably happened around 5,000 to 8,000 members. Um, up until then, it felt very like hard work to keep people engaged. And once it hit about five to 8,000 people, the conversation became more natural and uh, the amount of posts the community created uh, outweighed what I was creating. Does that help? Uh, so podcasts. My favorite podcast is How Stuff Works. Um, they have fascinating topics they always cover. But then also the Orby Marcus pod podcast, uh, the Better Man podcast, obviously. Um, I, mean, I have uh, Coaching for Leaders. I have uh, Nick Horolambos' podcast. Uh, I think he's spoken here before, Russ said as well. Dudes Doing Business, uh, the HBR idea cast, so it's the Harvard Business Review idea cast. Hidden Brain, also top rated. How I Built This, definitely check that out. Uh, law might be interesting for you. It's like, it's about law, obviously. Um, then the Perpetual Traffic Podcast, if you're interested in, in creating a digital business. And Self Made Man, check that out as well. Oh, and the Get Rich Quick Show, Richard Marlins. <laughs> Any other questions? So I, I find that curiosity in itself is a discipline. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to hear what other disciplines, because I, I, I feel like sometimes it's a set of disciplines that feed curiosity. What are the sort of peripheral disciplines that you, that you um, live in your life that support curiosity? So, you know, when I think of curiosity, so it, it means being interested in something, right? Um, and so I think the consumption that happens around us what feeds into it. So if you, if you don't have a specific uh, routine where you are taking in content that's specific to what you want to do, I think that's probably the best thing to incorporate into your, into your daily life. Um, for most of us, I think we have an overconsumption problem, that we just take in way too much garbage and it's like from everywhere. Uh, for me, I have very specific uh, sites that I want to take information from, which in itself can be a problem because you end up just feeding your own biases, right? So I think there's a mix of uh, choosing carefully the things that you want to take into your into your uh, into your mind, into your life, into your, your day, but then also being a bit more adventurous and and trying to look outside of yourself. So a stupid small example is uh, obviously being a coach. I'm very interested in self development, leadership, and all the content I take in is is more or less around that. And then in the beginning of the year, I said, well, you know what? I actually need to break away from that a bit. 
So in my in my podcast here now, I have things that are non-fiction, or they are fiction. So for the first time, I'm I'm thinking a little bit outside of my realm again, and that has really helped me this year with my talks and things because I get it's like like the How Stuff Works podcast. Um, they spoke about in one of their podcasts about Talos, the first automaton. And it was really interesting. It's something I never would have come across. And subsequently, I ended up using that in one of my emails. And like I could see how that could tie in certain talks. So I think it's important, and maybe that's the discipline here, is to just go beyond what's comfortable for you and, and get some new inputs, um, but still curate it, right? Um, there's just way too much information and too many people peddling information uh, on the back of no experience or no knowledge. Yes. Is better man just for men? Better man is just for men. Yes. <laughs> we have we have women uh, applying to the group quite frequently, and then I just have to decline them. I always feel like I should send a message saying that I'm sorry, but yeah, it's just for men. <laughs> yes, sir. Do you feel the quality of the writing varies? Or? Oh, all the time, all the time. Uh, some days, like you'll you'll hit the nail on the head, and I'll get a you know thirty forty replies saying, "Wow, this has really spoken to me today." And other times, you just see the unsubscribes rising. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's you know it's, when I just started writing the daily email, I would watch that uh, unsubscribe graph every day, and I'd log in and I'd see people unsubscribe, and I'd, it would like hit me. It would be it would be painful. And I remember like even emailing those people like, why did you unsubscribe? Just tell me. <laughs> like I was that needy person. And uh, only later did I realize that this person just said, please don't email me again. And then I went and emailed them again. So <laughs> yeah, it definitely there is. Um, and it's like, I mean, this week, you know, like when you're busy with other things, like uh, sometimes the quality slips a little bit, but it's just part of the game. You know, I think of someone like Seth Godin, uh, who inspired this daily email to a certain extent. And I've been doing this now for two years. He's done it for, I think, 12 years. And I read his email sometimes, I'm like, hmm. And then sometimes I read his email and it's profound, you know? So you can't create your best every day. And I'm, I'm actually in the process of, um, of writing a book. And part of the idea of the book was that we'll take the emails, the best emails, and we'll put that into the book. And so I went back and I looked through all my emails and I sort of ended up with about 50 to 60, which I thought was really good, that would be book worthy. So yeah, lots of variants. Yeah. Uh, sorry, many hands went up at the same time, I'll start here. Um, so you run a community of men. Yes. Um, so I'm curious, are there any, so I'm assuming that a lot of the podcasts, a lot of the learning that you take in um, are from prolific men, are there any women that you learn from as well? So, when I run, because I run Better Man, people often assume that I, we talk a lot about masculinity and those things, which we actually don't. Um, all the content that I take in, um, in terms of what I, what I put out, is slightly more generic. So even though, for example, Better Man is just a community of men, the content, a lot of the things we're discussing there could be applicable to women as well. Um, but just to answer your question, I think, um, I can't think of anyone who I read specifically, but so, some people who I've listened to and who stuff I've liked has been uh, Laura, Laura Vanderkam, Jane McConigal. Uh, she talks a lot about uh, like games and how it impacts our lives. Um, there's Cuddy, Cuddy, the lady who talks about body power, but like the different stances and you know her. She had an awesome TED talk. Uh, Cuddy someone. Just say Cuddy influence of body or posture. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty much it. I've never actually thought about that. Yeah, and my podcast is mainly just men. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Yes. So you are your own product. What happens if you land in hospital for two or three weeks and you're unable to, even if you want to, you're unable to put content up? What happens to your business then? Your Yeah. Listen, I mean, so at this stage, it kind of just is what it is, right? 
So luckily within the community, because it's been going for a while, there are many guys who are much more active than I am. So in terms of that part at least, I think that'll keep going. You know, the guys will keep it alive. Uh, but what's interesting is when you, when you write a daily email or when you do a podcast, you really uh, build rapport with your audience. And so they become like, a, I mean, I, I told you a bit earlier, how they would email me to say, are you okay? And so I know that if something had to happen to me, it, there would be a, um, an understanding at least. So I think that's one of the cool things of, of really caring about your audience is they care about you too. Yes. Uh, thanks. thanks for the talk. I just wanted to ask you, um, have you kept any of those other 45 odd ideas going? That you started out with all the URLs that you had on the website. Did you just abandon that and decide this is my path? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I had to abandon them. Um, you know, the, the problem is like back then I thought, oh, building a business is pretty easy. Like you get the website up, people come to your site, they give you money, and like you chill. So it didn't seem too hard. I learned the hard way that like, to build a business is actually pretty hard. Uh, to do two or three or four at the same time, like really just doesn't work. So I think um, the only one that ever really made money on this board here was findcrosstrainingshoes.com, <laughs> which uh, was about finding cross-training shoes. And the way we made money on it was that it linked to Amazon. And when you then go to Amazon and you buy the shoes, um, I'd get an affiliate commission. But the cool thing back then, I don't know if they still do it, is that if you clicked on my review of the shoe, which I never reviewed the shoe, like I just got the review from somewhere. If you clicked on that and you went through to Amazon and you also purchased a fridge, then I also got commission on that. So it was doing about 6,000 rand a month. But the way we got it to, to actually make money is that I got a few guys from India to do some really dodgy backlinking to the site. <laughs> And it put us at, at number one on Google. So if you entered that phrase, find cross training shoes, I was number one. Got lots of traffic. And then one day woke up to an email from Google saying, listen, we don't like what you're doing here. We've de-indexed your site. And so it was gone. Um, but that was pretty much it. What about modelsecrets.co.za? <laughs> yeah, I, just, I just can't expand on all of these. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Keen to meet was a dating site. Yeah, I don't want to even dig into these. <laughs> I think we have time for one more really good question. Cool. Uh, one more question. Really good. Really good. One more really good question. <laughs> So, uh, going through all of these, did that help me to get more direction? Definitely. You know, like, it's easy to look at this and think that it's all just failed ideas and failed attempts, but each of them taught me something. And more importantly, uh, I got better at what I was doing. So that's where the, this whole accretion process came in. You know, for four years, I just immersed myself in digital. And all I wanted to know was how do I better brand myself? How do I better get my message out to the world? And then because of that, when I finally found the thing that spoke to me, that was actually authentic to who I am, it was much easier to get it going. So I look at these and I can laugh about them, but I'm, I'm grateful for what it taught me. Thank you very much.